Island of the Blue Dolphins, Chapter 28 The earthquake did little damage. Even the spring which failed to flow for several days started up again and flowed more than ever. But the great waves had cost me all the food and weapons which were stored in the cave, as well as the canoe I had been working on and those hidden under the south cliffs. The canoes were the biggest lost. To find enough wood to make another would have taken me all the spring and summer. I therefore set out on the first fair morning to search for whatever wreckage the waves had washed ashore. Among the rocks near the south cliffs I found a part of one canoe buried in sand and twisted kelp. I worked all morning to dig it free and then, having scraped it clean, could not decide what to do. I could cut the snoos and carry the planks up the cliff two at a time on my back and across the dunes to the coral cove, which meant many days. Or I could build the canoe here on the rocks and take the chance that another storm would wash it away before I was finished. I finally did neither of these things. Choosing a day when the sea was calm, I floated what was left of the canoe and pushing it in front of me made my way past the sand spit and into the cove. There I took the wreckage apart and moved the planks up the trail, beyond the place where the great waves had reached. I found the remains of my other canoe. It had been washed far back in the cave, and I could not get it out, so I went back to the south cliffs and hunted among the piles of kelp until I had enough pieces of wood, counting what I already had, to begin the building of another. It was late in the spring now. The weather was still unsettled, with light rain falling most of the days, but I started the new canoe anyway, for I needed it to gather shellfish. No longer did I think of the Aleuts, as I have said, yet without a canoe to go where I wanted, I felt uneasy. The planks were all about the same size, the length of my arm, but they came from different canoes and were therefore hard to fit together. The holes were ready, however, which saved me much labor and time. Another help was that the great waves had washed ashore long strings of black pitch, which was often difficult to find on the island and which I needed. When I had sorted out the planks and shaped them, the work went fast, so that by late spring I was ready to finish the seams. It was on a windy morning that I made a fire to soften the pitch. The wind was cold, and it took a long time to get the fire going. To hasten it, I went down to the beach for dry seaweed. I had started back with my arms filled when I turned to look at the sky, thinking from the feel of the wind that a storm might be close. Off to the north, the skies were clear, but in the east, from whence storms sometimes came at this season, stood banks of gray clouds, one on top of the other. At this moment, in the deep shadows cast by the clouds, I saw something else. Forgetting that I was carrying a load of seaweed, I threw up my arms. The seaweed fell to the ground. A sail, a ship, was there on the sea, halfway between the horizon and the shore. By the time I had reached the headland, it was much closer, moving quickly on the strong wind. I could see that it did not have the red, beaked prow of the lutes, nor did it look like the white man's ship which I clearly remembered. Why had it come to the island of the blue dolphins? I crouched on the headland and wondered, my heart beating fast, if the men who sailed it had come to catch otter. If they were hunters, I must hide before they saw me. They would soon find my fire and the canoe I was making, yet I could go to the cave and probably be safe from them. But if they had been sent by my people to take me away, then I should not hide. The ship moved slowly between the black rocks and into Coral Cove. I could see the men now, and they were not the Aleuts. They lowered a canoe, and two of the men paddled toward the beach. The wind had begun to blow hard, and the men had trouble landing. Finally, one of them stayed behind in the canoe, and the other, the man without a beard, jumped into the water and came along the beach and up the trail. I could not see him, but after a while I heard a shout, then another, and I knew that he had found my fire in the canoe. The man he had left in the cove did not answer, nor did the men on the ship, so I was sure that he was calling to me. I crawled down from the rock and went to the house. Since my shoulders were bare, I put on my otter cape. I took my cormorant skirt and the abalone box 
in which I kept my necklace and earrings. With Rantu Aru, I then went along the trail that led to Coral Cove. I came to the mound where my ancestors had sometimes camped in the summer. I thought of them and of the happy time spent in my house on the headland, of my canoe lying unfinished beside the trail. I thought of many things, but stronger was the wish to be where people lived, to hear the voices and their laughter. I left the mound and the green grass growing on it among the white shells. I could no longer hear the man calling, so I began to run. When I came to the place where the two trails met, where I had built my fire, I found the footsteps the man had left. I followed them down to the cove. The canoe had gone back to the ship. The wind was screaming now, and mist blew in across the harbor, and waves began to pile up on the shore. I raised my hand and shouted. I shouted over and over, but the wind carried my voice away. I ran down the beach and waded into the water. The men did not see me. Rain started to fall, and the wind drove it against my face. I waded farther out through the waves, raising my arms to the ship. Slowly it moved away in the mist. It went toward the south. I stood there until it was out of sight.